Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Maria Cortez Puig, the Vice President of Networks at SDSN. I see that many of you are already introducing yourselves and there's people from everywhere around the world. So this is extremely exciting for us. Um, so today's dialogue is framed within a series of discussions that will take place throughout the next few months. Um, each of these discussions will revolve around one of the key topics that came out in um, the recently launched report uh, from SDSN, Accelerating Education for the SDGs in Universities. So um, at SDSN, we believe that universities have a critical role to play in helping implement the SDGs. In fact, we were launched in 2012 precisely to support the implementation of these goals by mobilizing academia. However, um, we know that the SDGs offer a phenomenal, um, a comprehensive, and also a very complex agenda. Um, it lays out a pathway to a, to, to a sustainable future, um, but one that will require deep transformations. And so it's, it's key that universities transform themselves in order to be better fit to support the implementation of the goals. Um, this should not be, one, one would think that this should not be that hard because universities have for centuries been the place where critical thinking has happened, where knowledge barriers have been pushed and disruptive technologies have been invented. No? But the truth is that universities are having a hard time uh, evolving, especially at the rapid and, and at the very uh, drastic level that the SDGs require. Um, we have 1,300 member institutions from around the world, most of them universities, but uh, others uh, research centers and other high education institutions. Um, and we hear from them, we hear from professors, we hear from students, but we also hear from their presidents how, um, how difficult it is to break the silos or how tough um, and how challenging it is to focus on the, the, the challenges that their communities are facing because they are immersed in bureaucracy or um, in other processes that impede uh, rapid uh, action. Um, this is precisely why we thought that it would be very interesting to start this dialogue series with this question of how can universities transform themselves and what are some of the key elements that will be necessary to better support the implementation of the SDGs. So to, to discuss this, we have a phenomenal lineup today. Um, let me very briefly uh, discuss the agenda uh, right now and then I'll move on to a couple of housekeeping uh, questions and we'll get started. So to begin with, uh, we have Otto Scharmer that is very well known for his theory U. He's a senior lecturer in the MIT Management Slo Sloan School and a co-founder of the Presencing Institute. He will be giving a keynote speech that will be followed by a panel, a panel, an all-female panel with four phenomenal speakers such as Wendy Parcel uh, from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the former president of Plymouth University. We have Luz uh, Beaulieu, executive director at the Interdisciplinary Research, uh, sorry, Center for Research on Sustainable Development Operationalization. We have Sarah Mendelssohn, professor at Carnegie uh, Mellon and former US representative to the ECOSOC at the UN. And we have Amelia Clark, associate professor and associate dean of research from the University of Waterloo. After the panel, we will hear a brief presentation on this report on accelerating education uh, for the SDGs in universities uh, from Julio Lumbreras. Julio is uh, a tenured professor at the uh, Technical University in Madrid and visiting scholar at Harvard University. Julio is one of the co-authors of this guide and I should say the lead author of the chapter that focuses on the transformation question. The center that he comes from at the Technical University in Madrid has been thinking about this for a while and experimenting with how um, it could transform itself and the university. 
So um, just a final word on how you can participate. Um, many of you are already using the chat function. Feel free to continue to do so throughout the event. Make sure to post uh, links to your, um, to your research or to your work. We want to hear from you. We also have a question and answer um, tab that you can use to ask questions and also to vote on the most um, relevant question. So with these, I'm going to give the floor to Otto Scharmer. Um, Otto, if you want to turn on your camera and mic. Great. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, and uh, hello, uh, everyone. Um, so uh, listening to your opening remarks, Maria, um, reminds me really um, also that the issue that you describe, all the things we know we should do different, and then how little is actually happening in terms of real transformation, that's a real microcosm of our current moment, right? You go to uh, companies today, you talk to uh, governments, you talk to uh, uh, public institutions, um, wherever you go, it's the same problem. So decision makers, uh, leaders, or people inside the organization, they are quite aware of what we do currently is not sufficient, that we need to profoundly transform. Yet, um, what we enact, the, the, the strategies and the policies and the change efforts, right, are hugely inadequate to the situation, the disruption that we face. And uh, so that's, uh, in other words, what we often end up doing is optimizing what we have rather than reimagining and reshaping the future and the path forward. So that's, in other words, what we face in universities and higher ed today is just really a microcosm. Maybe you could say an extreme version. Um, but it is a microcosm of the bigger transformation challenge we face as a society. So when uh, Julio and I had the, the pre-conversation to the session, so the, basically what he said in the briefing is talk about the how, right? We know everything about the what, we know everything about the why, uh, but talk about the how. So the how of transformation. And when I really think to my, uh, think about my, so then, I sat down and um, thought about my own experience. How, how, how was it in my own life? Kind of how did I, what can I really say from my own experience uh, to that, uh, on that topic? So I have, uh, you know, um, six points, six, maybe seven, we'll see, six or seven points that kind of little nuggets that resonate. Uh, uh, I think the report is really wonderful. I particularly like the, the notion of the second operating system that I want to uh, come back to later on. But I want to ground really kind of the issue of transformation in my own experience to make it real. Uh, and I'm sure it, it will um, resonate with many of your experiences as well. And that could be an opener for the conversation uh, later on. So the first um, item that I put down is uh, people. I remember when I um, entered the first university, it was, um, so I'm just aging myself here, uh, 90, so in the early 1980s uh, in Berlin, uh, Free University Berlin. And um, so after my social service and all of that, I was hugely disappointed by really, I had so many illusions about what a university could be, but there was one person, one visiting professor, uh, so his name was uh, Johann Galtung, the peace researcher, um, and uh, who really embodied a whole other way of um, a whole different understanding of what science and social science can be really in participating and in kind of making the world a better place. Science as seeking and breaking of invariances. And um, 
Eleanor Roche uh, later on talked about uh, science must be performed with the mind of wisdom. So when I, as a student back then, experienced, I saw a lot of mediocrity right uh, around me. I was pretty depressed. I saw one single person that operated uh, from a different place. That was enough to switch on a flame within me that never ceased to exist until today. It's really interesting when you think about that. So when you also think about the responsibility that we have as, as, as educators, right? So the way you show up is actually making a difference, right? So one, so I saw many people or many contexts that made me depressed. It was one person that switched on a flame that put me on a different path. So that's maybe the first principle. It's people and it means how we show up, right? So the inner place that we are operating from. And uh, it's also a pedagogical principle because if you put people in front of, say, other change makers that operate from a deeper place of purpose, that is, there is an funny alchemy at work, right? So when you see these people, they are switching on a deeper resonance within yourself that you didn't even realize was existing before. So I would say that's the first principle, kind of people who operate from that deeper place that can be entrepreneurs, but of course uh, it can be also um, the way you perform science. Um, number two is place. The power of place. So when we think about transformation, it's really about the power of place. And uh, I was lucky in my life. Uh, I, I ended up later in a, in a newly founded university. There was very little there, but very high aspiration. And it was kind of an innovative pedagogical concept, basically student-centric learning, theory, practice, and you know, you, you know, participate in the world, you come back, reflect, and these kind of things. But there wasn't really a lot there except uh, one or two faculty who were um, who could think that who could embody that new pedagogical approach and empower students. So, what you really need? I mean, the foundation of transforming universities, of course, is our young people, right? It's students. But you can only. I remember the the, the path I went through. So. These, this one person, it was really one person uh, essentially, believed in our capacity to activate our own agency that I, when I came in, wasn't even fully aware of uh, existed. So a place, so the second component, it really is power of place in a sense that you not only are literate, right, in terms of student-centric learning, but really a power of place of believing in the deeper dormant capacities that we as young people bring into the world and that in the right context, in the right environment can be um, activated. Number three, practice fields. You need tools, right? If you don't have tools, if you don't have uh, practice fields, uh, these new, um, and what I mean with practice field is basically a safe environment that allows you to engage in new ways of operating, new ways of, deeper ways of listening, you know, a more co-creative way of having a conversation. And what we learned over the past decade or two really is that for these practice fields, when we talk about the deeper transformative capacities, social arts are essential. It's social arts, but it's also the art and practice of deep listening, and it's also um, really the um, um, uh, deep dialogue or generative dialogue. So an example in our context for that is coaching circles, right? And these practice fields are small scale usually. So, so you need to, it's often groups of five or small kind of face-to-face -face groups that need to build these safe spaces and go through these um, uh, experiences. 
So practice fields in terms of methods and tools that help us to activate our deeper transformative uh, uh, capacities. Number four, um, partners. Uh, so partners, with partners I mean kind of the local or regional or global ecosystem of partners that allow us to connect with, with living examples of the new, but also really with the front line of transformational change that is going on in our communities, that's going on on our planet. And one of the most uh, vital functions, I think, of the universities of the futures and currently uh, and partly already today is to connect young people with the right kind of places, with that entire ecosystem. It takes a village, it takes a global ecosystem. A lot has happened there. A lot is happening as we speak, right? In you know, broadening the focus of learning from campus really towards that entire ecosystem of societal transformation where we realize that the most important ingredient right that we get that we have for learning is what it's the challenge it's the challenges that we are exposed to because the the challenges the real world challenges are the surface that allow me to activate some of the these deeper dormant um, capacities five um, pathways for transformation um, what I mean really with that is, um, I mean, if, if we go many, I mean, I'm not just uh, reminding ourselves, what is the one thing we have learned from innovation management? Well, where does the new grow? Not inside, you know, the old, if you have really radical innovation, you need to create a place that allows this, that allows the new operating system or the new way of operating to develop at its own terms. So if you plant these innovations inside the old system, guess what happens? Kind of the immune system is um, basically killing it before it can develop. So um, the pathways for transformation is really if, if you know, what we try to do has to do with whole person, whole systems learning, basically which is at odds with uh, most of the other activities that are going on on campus right now, where does that sit? And often it sits actually at the periphery, right? In electives, but um, I think uh, where can we create this kind of um, second layer? And that's where I thought in the report, um, this second operating system was a really interesting term. And when you look from a systems perspective at transformation, what do you see? You see that transformation usually happens first at the periphery, right? So it's almost like kind of around the old institutions of education is growing a new layer, right? So the second operating system, at least here and there, where we, where these uh, deep learning practices and in our action learning uh, practices, are being cultivated and supported and amplified. So uh, examples there uh, that and and you know the one thing we know is if, if you want to develop if you want to develop this second operating system you need a supporting infrastructure there. And um, so um, that basically prevents the immune system reaction of the old system to kick in and provides kind of the right kind of uh, practices and uh, new learning environments. So an interesting example that I came across there is uh, Stockholm School of Economics basically boiling down the old system by, um, you know, from 100% of 66 and then taking one third of the credit points and of the time that students have towards uh, basically the second operating system, right? Towards um, immersing themselves with the global challenges, developing the deeper personal learning practices, and then applying all of that in action learning initiatives that help these institutions in the city and in the country to, um, uh, to address SDG-related challenges. So that's one way, right, to just kind of boil down the old structure by, you know, uh, you know, by a third and free up space that is um, used in a new way. 
Another one, historically, if you is basically starting from scratch, right? So it's a possibility as well. The historical example there is the Danish folk high school, which is probably one of the most successful interventions uh, on a country level or regional level even, um, and has created the foundations for what today is known as the Nordic model, right? So um, that would be basically totally new places disconnected from the traditional system would be the alternative. But I think the, uh, what we saw are kind of uh, pedagogical institutions that 100% operate on the new operating system, right? So that's the alternative. One of those two things, I think. Um, and then the last one, so the, the item number six here uh, on my list is really maybe the one that should have been first, and maybe that is the most important, uh, and that is the pedagogy. Uh, we need a new pedagogy, and uh, I want to just um, end with uh, sharing, um, uh, you know, um, a few um, uh, images here. So. Um, and uh, a few of my own learnings. So um, when I developed Theory U, which is like an approach to uh, the second operating system, right, as, as a pedagogy, I started by listening to practitioners, right? I started by listening to people who created something profoundly new in business, science, or society, or the creative arts. And by listening to them, I realized that they describe actually a different learning process than we usually, the one that we usually operate uh, by in, in higher ed or in education today. And one of them, the, the late CEO of Hanover Insurance, uh, summarized that um, way of operating or his most important learning throughout all his own episodes of leading his company through transformational change with this line, the success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. So he says, the success of what I do as a change maker, as a leader, depends on the inner place from that I operate. And then, of course, the question that, so when I heard that, right, I, I, um, the question that was, evoked, um, that was evoked in me is, what is this inner place? And the way I would describe this inner place today is in terms of these three capacities, open mind, open heart, open will, AKA activating curiosity, compassion, and courage. And that's basically what, um, you know, what, what are key capacities of awareness-based systems change to, to go through this cycle of deep connection, uh, to uh, you know the, the larger field we are part of, the connection to our deeper source of knowing, and then the prototyping and learning by doing. Now, if we look into real reality, what we see it, uh, what, what do we see going on the past few years? Uh, mostly the exact opposite, right? So what, what's being amplified is a freeze reaction of the human mind um, uh, in terms of that an amplification of operating on doubt hate and fear. So uh, rather than, you know, uh, seeing, sensing, letting go, connecting with the emerging future, it's denial, entrenching, desensing, and holding on to the past and disconnecting to, uh, and, you know, rather than bringing the new into reality, it's like, uh, you know, uh, enact, collectively enacting patterns of destruction and self-destruction. So all of that, I don't need to explain these cycles, all of that is going on today. And I think if we talk about transformation, if we talk about preparing people to what's ahead of us in this century, this is what we need to deal with, right? We need to develop capacities that engage and transform these deeper building blocks, these deeper conditions that are, uh, you know, that capture so much energy today. And that's kind of the condition, the macro condition of post-truth, post-democracy, post-humanity, by which I mean basically the spread of disinformation and doubt, uh, architectures of separation that lead to the polarization that we witness in so many countries today, and the issue of you know, fanaticism and fear and anxiety. Um, 
And so we as educators, when, you, when we see these amplifications up here, you, we can basically say, what is that really? What is this phenomenon that we are dealing, aka Trumpism or whatever name you want to give it? And what it is, is it's a massive institutional failure. It's a massive failure of education today because what we really need to transform that is deeper learning and leadership capacities that have to do with the essence of science, right? Let the data talk to us, which means we need to listen with more humility. We need to build and hone that capacity uh, in order to move beyond post-truth conditions really move beyond post-democracy is we need to build new architectures of connection. We need to cultivate the capacity to sense the social field or to sense the, sense the system from the edges, kind of through the eyes of the other uh, partners and collaborators and stakeholders in the system. And moving beyond the, 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 the fear issue uh, is really has to do what my, my colleague Eva Pomeroy and I taught, uh, you know, call action confidence. We have, in our institutions of, uh, of education, we have to build the capacity to uh, you know, step into our action confidence, by which I mean, can you sense and then step into, begin to actualize, emerging future possibilities, right? When you deal with disruption, are you holding on to the past or can you really sense and actualize the future as it emerges? I think that's really the challenge because the only thing we know is we are just at the 2020, right? The, the, the year of disruption, that's just the beginning. I mean, you know, you just look at climate, uh, biodiversity, social inequality, or the other issues, it's the beginning. So. The only thing we know is we will see more of this stuff up here, which means we have to be more uh, intentional in building these deeper capacities here. And that's really all I have to say at the end of the day. So if this is what we try to do, planetary healing and civilizational renewal, then the only way of doing that is if we develop the capacity to activate generative social fields to move toxic stakeholder relationships into a quality of interaction that's co-creative and generative. And the only way of doing that is if we have support structures, right, that help us, right? I mean, that's the only thing we learned in the past 80 years of change management. If you want to go through transformational change, you need a support structure, right? I call it here school for transformation because that support structure, particularly in its vertical, kind of the, uh, the, the, the transformation literacy or the vertical transformation literacy, that's precisely what's most missing in our current schools of uh, our institutions of education. So the school for transformation that I think we need as a multi-local global infrastructure inside all universities today has to do uh, with democratizing access to transformation literacy, democratizing access to our capacity to sense and actualize emerging future possibilities. And um, that does require, if you build this infrastructure, it does require, I think, these, um, these uh, six things that I try to describe a little bit. So that's, if I'm honest, right, uh, based on my experience of what I have seen, uh, that's something I have been, yeah, living through firsthand. So that's kind of true, at least as far as my experience in my own journey, but also in working with institution is concerned. And I'm looking forward to discuss that with the rest of you, how that resonates or what other, uh, with your, your experience and uh, what additional aspects you bring into the conversation based on the context that you're operating in. Otto, thank you so much. That was so inspirational. Um, 
I, I have a thousand questions, but I think uh, I if you have five minutes, um, can I read you some of the questions that um, our participants are asking and voting for? Sure, absolutely. No, I, I will stay on also for the later part of the conversation. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, one of the questions that has received more votes says how to accelerate universities from the not progress countries. From the not pro progress countries, what does that mean? I, I, I have the same question as you. Um, I wonder if it means from countries that don't necessarily have the same the advanced resources or so. Um, well, I mean, um, I think that, yeah, so that, that could have many connotations than not progress countries. So, so you could read that in many ways. But I would say um, uh, one of the, um, I mean, we all, just are living through this moment, right? The 2020 moment and it, um, so what used to be a special access only for a few people who live in a, in a few places just got democratized a whole lot, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's really great news. And so there's, um, there is, in terms of the uh, moving digital more, uh, the positive side is this really the democratization in, in access and in the conversation. The downside, of course, is it's um, too flat. It's usually just, you know, here, right, in that box. And, um, uh, but that's where we can actually do a lot. So, uh, and a lot means infrastructure, kind of, kind of how to organize multi-local, how to really kind of blend the digital backbone with global ecosystem kind of live sessions with very personal small face-to-face -face groups and practices and how to how to also link um, like a gro global ecosystem conversation with uh, local place-based initiatives right how to organize in multi-local ways I think we have been learning a lot and in, um, I think it, it allows us to, what, what hasn't happened yet is to integrate these innovations really fully into, let's say, kind of the university curriculum. And I think that is beginning to happen in places. And that's exactly where this second operating system that you talk about, um, Julio and others talk about in the report, is such an interesting concept because that's what we need. We cannot mainstream it from zero to 100. We need kind of these um, extra spaces where these new ways of operating are explored together. So I think the, um, uh, uh, through what we have been, the, the uh, events of this year, the, the playing field has been democratized a lot more than it used to be before. Yeah, definitely. Um one could argue forever what does not progress mean, but I think uh, it has become clear that what we considered progress wasn't such when it comes to handling something like, for example, the pandemic, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's also true. And it's, it's also that I think there is a, a learning edge how we, how we organize around ecosystems. There's a learning edge how we develop blended forms of kind of, you know, linking local in-person connectivity or regional with, you know, a global digital uh, web of conversations that also mm -hmm. can be quite personal. I think those are, you know, uh, methods and tools that exist, but that uh, uh, require a certain literacy in how you hold a space I think the whole concept of holding space that's also mentioned in the um, mm -hmm. uh, second operating system is of such an, uh, such an importance because um, in many ways the, um, the, the conversations and the, um, the interactions um, need to be more systemic on the one hand relating to the real world challenges, but they also need to be a lot more personal, right? It's kind of... Yeah where the personal, what is most personal is most systemic these days. I think that's a line 
I once heard uh, my colleague Peter Senge saying, and that's, uh, that's very true today, and, and we can experience that in many places. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Otto, I'm going to propose that we move into the panel because the next few questions I think could be addressed also by our colleagues in the panel. Um, so Otto has been mentioning uh, the second operation system as well as the holding environment that are all described in more detail in chapter four of the of the report. Um, let me then ask uh, Wendy Purcell uh, to join us and to turn her camera on. Uh, Wendy made uh, a lot of contributions to the guide specifically to promote more of these, uh, um, this chapter and this uh, theory of change. So Wendy, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me along to the SDSN event. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that higher education matters. Uh, what we do here matters. And I think never more so than now as we we battled these uh, pandemics of COVID-19 and inequity in our society. And I think in these times of uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, so-called VUCA conditions, the SDGs can, can be a beacon to help guide our collective efforts. And so with 17 goals and 169 targets, I don't want to get lost in the detail, rather, what the SDGs represent, uh, the nearest thing we have to a strategy for the world, a world where no one is left behind. And their importance for me is their hyper-dependent and interconnected nature of the SDGs, where the economy and society are nested into the biosphere. We can't have a thriving economy with prosperity for all, or a healthy society based on a dead planet. So looking at the SDGs and institutional transformation, the key thing for me is to focus on what we do here. Our mission as universities and colleges, as it relates to teaching learning, research and innovation, community service and engagement. Rather than something we add on to an already hectic schedule for faculty, staff and students. We need to use the SDGs as the lens through which we look at what we do here, not something more to do. So it's a bit like we put on our SDG goggles and we look afresh at the teaching and learning. We look again at our research and innovation and we look anew at our community service. We need to integrate this higher purpose into the day job. So it becomes just the way we do things around here. We need to reframe the SDGs as a strategic agenda for higher education. Universities are, are full of people excited by problems, seeking solutions, pushing back the boundaries of knowledge and nurturing the next generation of leaders and scholars. So embracing uh, the SDGs is not something we impose on an academic community. Rather, the goals can represent a call to action for faculty, students and staff, helping us reimagine our purpose and lead through uncertainty, driving academic excellence and impact and helping sustain the institution in the face of disruption and global challenges. All well and good, you may say, but how? What does this look like? Can you tell me in this new agenda for the university, where am I in this? And this is where the SDSN's guide for universities, colleges, and tertiary and higher education institutions comes firmly into play. The guide accelerating education for the SDGs is full of information for the sector about the what, the why and the how. And today we're focusing on discussing the enabling infrastructure at the institutional level, helping the university or college become transformed so that delivery against and fulfillment of the SDGs becomes part of our academic mission. 
I was pleased to be involved in the development of the guide. So let me turn to some practical examples and identify four ways to promote institutional transformation. The first is how we can harness the incredible convening power of universities and colleges to bring faculty, staff and students together with others from the communities we serve, from civil society and business around a shared agenda, embracing the concept of a living laboratory. The second is through the development of programs and courses that bring together disciplines in novel ways to address the SDGs and equip our students with knowledge, learning and skills for the 21st century. Actually, I think the same is true for research problems, where again, the campus can be a living lab for societal inquiry. And when I talk of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary efforts, this is not about dissolving so-called disciplinary silos. It's not an anti-disciplines agenda. It's about maintaining strong disciplinary communities who can then bring their unique perspectives around a problem. This agenda must be driven by intellectual curiosity. The third is by creating some sort of structural coordinating hub what we call in the guide a second operating system, as Otto mentioned. So this is there to support the university or college, engage with the SDGs and promote radical collaboration. This creates a, a meeting place for public, private and plural organisations in the city, wider region, as well as globally. And it enables innovation within established university systems as these, as we know, take time to change. And finally, the university needs to do this on its own terms and connect with its distinctive academic mission. In this way, it's locally rooted and globally connected to the SDGs. And in doing so, higher education needs to walk the talk, deal with its carbon footprint, its impact investing, its promotions criteria and so on. This agenda needs to be baked in to the culture and become just the way we do things around here. This global SDG agenda framed by the University of College and made personal. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was very inspirational. And again, thank you for your contribution to your to the guide uh, itself. I think we're going to move to the next speaker and move along the panel, and then I'll ask uh, uh, all of all of you some questions. So, uh, Luz um, comes from a center in Canada that is very experienced in these transdisciplinary research, and we're very eager to hear from your experiences. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks for, for inviting us. So uh, I'm Luz Beaulieu, Executive Director of the CIRAD. We are a center uh, located in the province of Quebec in Canada, and we are a strategic cluster. So this means that we uh, basically group together uh, 14 universities, four colleges, and our members are full professors who operate uh, and teach in all of these institutions. We have 95 members and uh, at any given time, between 200 and 300 students who gravitate within this academic ecosystem. Um, I feel like, uh, Wendy, you uh, set the table very well for um, discussing the way that we do things. And so um, I'm going to move from a more theoretical level to maybe a more operational level. So we have the word operationalization in uh, the name of our center and um, we have changed the mission of the center in 2019 when we were funded again by the Quebec research funds. We are funded by the FRQNT for nature and technology and FRQSC for société culture and this is very atypical in uh, the case of a strategic cluster and um, when we renewed the mission we uh, decided to focus on societal transformation in a sustainable innovation way, mobilizing transdisciplinarity. 
And very early on, uh, Mohamed Chérier, who is the general director of the center, focused on the SDGs and specifically on the Agenda 2030 to guide the center's uh, mission towards socioeconomical progress. And so very early on uh, in the new uh, life of our center, we decided to become members of SDSN Canada to start attending the ICF, the, um, the uh, International Conference at Columbia every year. And uh, we decided to, uh, that everything that we do was, would be guided by the SDGs. Therefore, we have established a number of uh, high level strategic projects that we uh, conduct every year. And right now, I'm going to talk to you about two uh, strategic projects one of them which is in um, in full swing and about to be published in December and the second one which will be deployed uh, next summer so summer of 2021. So the first project is uh, the definition of sustainable innovation. Sustainable innovation is something that we feel can be a guiding principle for research and development but also for the field um, and this is something that we felt needed a definition, needed tools, and needed orientations. And this is exactly what we've been working on since uh, last March. We have a fantastic team of students who have been um, doing a literature review on this topic. And uh, we have a database that is based on different criteria to define sustain sustainable innovation, as it also pertains, of course, to the SDGs. So very soon in December, it's going to be published. Uh, it's going to be published in French and we are considering um, doing a translation of the executive summary. And so this is like one of the first core pieces that we felt would be um, one of the beacons of the center. And we're very happy to be publishing it. We've tested it out in an international summit about a week ago with different stakeholders. And we're very much looking forward to having some feedback from um, maybe perhaps people who are here right now uh, interacting um, in this panel. And so the second piece that I would like to, to talk to you about today is the uh, Summer School in Societal Transformation, which will be deployed in the summer of 2021. And I feel like this project specifically addresses a lot of the social practice fields that um, Dr. Sharma evoked a couple of minutes ago. And I think that it's something that ties into um, many different um, uh, challenges that we are faced in terms of the operational system of uh, the universities. So this summer school, uh, we would like for it to be um, multi-stakeholder. It's going to be targeted towards um, SDG, uh, the, S the uh, many of the SDGs, which are of course uh, interlinked, but mostly the SDGs of cities and communities because uh, the different components of the city is the key competencies in order to achieve the SDGs, which uh, are the new ways that uh, students and change agents need to be equipped in order to change, you know, this operational, this uh, operating system. On the one hand, um, the SDGs, of course, as a guiding principle in the context of cities. And so the case studies, the experts are going to be city based. And the fact of the matter is that the summer school is a way to experiment with a new operational system for universities because the summer school is planned to be around key competencies that mobilize the different disciplines that are taught in the universities to bring them together in an experiential way in order for people to be able to sense the system on the one hand and try and co-create some solutions for the new world that wants to emerge. We are not necessarily steeped in the theory you at the moment, but we certainly know about the principles and uh, we absolutely believe that this is the kind of experimentation that has the potential to transform maybe in the midterm or longer term, 
the way that sustainability is taught in universities. And the way that this um, school is going to be evaluated and the way that this school is then going to be um, scaled is something that we're very much looking forward to after the first deployment because the different components that are going to be experimented with with this school can then be lengthened or shortened, uh, adapted to different realities, to different sectors, to different organizations, and maybe even perhaps have the power to uh, modify, transform parts of the curriculum in different universities, whether they be engineering schools or social and humanity schools. Um, we believe that this is a model that can then be um, spliced if we're talking in terms of DNA into different curriculums, different courses and different realities. So these are the two main projects that um, that I wanted to present to you. But the CIRAD is also a center that has many other different projects and that has decided to transform itself from the first uh, CIRAD, which uh, ended in 2019 to uh, for us looking towards 2026, which will be the end of this cycle of funding. And so the way that we've decided to transform ourselves is to transform our governance. Of course, we have uh, a direction committee, we have a scientific committee, but we decided to innovate also in terms of co-creating a uh, comité d'orientation mixte, so a mixed stakeholder committee, bringing in actors from the field to co-govern -go the, the, the cluster with us bringing in their knowledge, bringing in their needs um, in a theory of change. And um, this is something that's incredibly exciting. It's the first time that we've experimented with this kind of governance. And um, we're very much looking forward to seeing what the results of um, this co-governance is going to be. Um, I would also like to talk about the fact that as a cluster operating in many universities, we have this unique point of view, this bird's eye view of what is going on in 14 different universities and four different colleges in terms of not only sustainability, but also the way that education and training is actually occurring. And what we're actually trying to do is to be an organization that can add value to all of the institutions, to all of the change agents that we're working with in the main uh, different activity polls that we have. And basically, the way that we want to add value is by creating um, in partnership uh, these different concepts and offering them as a gift to them so that they can implement them in their own organizations. So in effect, probably acting a little bit like this second layer that was discussed a little bit before. Um, there's a lot of different things that I could talk about, uh, but I would like to leave some time for the other speakers and also for, um, for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luz. We are indeed going to be moving to our next next speaker, Sara Mendelssohn, um, that has been working on university voluntary reviews in Carnegie Mellon. Sara, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, there's so many remote meetings where I feel like it's fine that it's remote. Um, we can still get our work done, but this one, I feel it's really a shame that we're not all together. Um, it has been incredibly inspirational. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to talk about why the SDGs are appealing, uh, why they're especially urgent now, what Carnegie Mellon has been doing a little bit about the voluntary university review, and really to be humble about this. This is very much a work in progress. Um, but sort of drifting a bit off of what Otto was, was speaking about and his experience in Berlin, I, I want to tell you that I come to this as a political scientist, as a Russia specialist, as somebody who's worked on democracy and human rights for 25 years plus, somebody who spent five years in the Obama administration, four at the US Agency for International Development, and was part of the uh, team trying to get the SDGs launched, and then as an ambassador to the uh, ECOSOC uh, at the US UN. 
um, when I left the Obama administration, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do, and SDGs and youth were really the things that were driving me, in part because I came to this as somebody who'd worked on human rights and felt that human rights were under siege in many places, and why was that? Uh, and what needed to happen differently? Uh, and listening to the other speakers this morning, th there are lots of paradigm shifts, and, and there's a reason why, in part, it's been difficult on some level to get, to really uh, create an SDG movement. And you all are part of this SDG movement, and we hope that your friends and your neighbors and your family will soon also be a part of that. The number one paradigm shift, and why it's so important, is a different conception of sustainability. Um, lots of colleagues think of sustainability only in the environmental context, and this is about reducing inequality and creating peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. So yes, it's about social justice, and it is a nonpartisan agenda, but I would say it is, it is political. Um, it is social, political, economic, and environmental. Um, and, you know, again, with this, a lot of how we have discussed development in the past has been with a Cold War frame. Uh, and this is a paradigm shift in that. This is development happening everywhere. Uh, so there's another paradigm shift of this applies domestically. And the silos between what is domestic and what is foreign or foreign policy are eroding. So development happens in Washington, DC. It happens in Kigali, where Carnegie Mellon also has a campus, in Doha, where we have a campus, and obviously in, in Pittsburgh. So all of this is hugely relevant for right now. The paradigm shift I'd like to see uh, involved in both for our students, um, but also for the way in which a lot of the work goes on, is one in which listening and responding become absolutely paradigm. And again, if you're working in global development, if you're working in community development, that this would be paradigm. But it is not how a lot of times the work happens. And so trying to generate and grow uh, a generation that is focused on local needs, listening and responding, the co-creation that everybody's been talking about is really, really fundamental. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, just to be very sort of practical and, and within a minute or two, um, we've had a lot of senior support. Uh, the provost of the university uh, in the summer of 2019, after a lot of discussion within the university community, uh, got very excited about a sustainability initiative that was framed around the SDGs, uh, appointed a steering committee. I'm a co-chair of the steering committee. We meet weekly. Um, we just were presenting to the Student Affairs Council at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, there are three of us, and we were joined by the person who created the voluntary local review for New York City, the concept of VLR, taking the VNR, how countries communicate, to the city level, and then we adopted, Alex Hineker joined us in January 2020, and we uh, issued the Voluntary University Review for Carnegie Mellon in September 2020. Um, it is an iterative process. Uh, it, it looks at education, research, and practice for Carnegie Mellon, how we align. It was a first uh, effort. It was done in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, and we have lots of challenges uh, in terms of information systems and being able to capture everything that we've, we've found. Um, we've launched this, obviously, at the beginning of the decade of action. And our challenges are uh, many, including making sure people understand this is not the provost voluntary university review. This is everybody's. So being able to get everybody involved and understand that it is voluntary and it is a review the way in which people in general are, are talking about these things. I want to end just by saying, looping it back to the human rights piece, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is create communities of practice using the SDGs. So I'm in discussion with colleagues uh, in different universities, uh, but also inside the university, of how you would teach and train um, students interested in human rights differently using the SDGs. So this goes beyond legal frameworks, um, rooted hopefully in local conditions in the city. Uh, and what's nice about, I'm coming to you from Washington DC, but Carnegie Mellon's main campus is in Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, we're seeing this incredible ecosystem supporting the SDGs. 
Uh, so with colleagues from the University of Pittsburgh, we're exploring what this community of practice would be uh, tomorrow. The city of Pittsburgh is going to release their voluntary local review. There are lots of stakeholders in Pittsburgh that are engaged in SDG work. Uh, and so along with Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, Chatham University, the city of Pittsburgh, private sector, local philanthropy, it's, it is a living lab and it is happening. Um, the, the challenge for us, I think, is really being able to show quite quickly what I call the SDG effect. Are people's lives improving? Are we able to reduce inequities and inequality in ways that deliver for everybody? Um, and that's, that is our challenge. So I'm gonna end there and really look forward to a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. And um, it's a great way to move into our uh, final speaker, Amelia. Um, from the University of Waterloo that has quite a bit of experience with living labs and, and creating these communities of, of um, practice. Amelia, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Um, really a pleasure to be here and it does follow very nicely from the last presentation. So I'm going to talk to you about institutionalizing the SDGs at your universities. I'm going to start by just opening uh, by explaining a sustainability management system for a campus and then I'll use my my university the University of Waterloo as a case uh, not because we have it perfect by any means but just to, to show an example of, of how we've institutionalized the SDGs. So thinking about a campus sustainability management system some of you may be familiar with this concept already it's it's the same um, management system as you would see with an environmental management system and in fact many management systems work the same way so it starts with a policy um, at the at the university level then you make a plan to implement your policies so some kind of sustainability strategy or sustainability plan often with action plans underneath it then you implement then you check typically through sustainability reporting or perhaps through the, the voluntary um, reviews that Sarah was talking about. And then you have oversight happening um, typically through a multi-stakeholder committee campus-wide. And it's a, a cycle of continual improvement. So now coming to the University of Waterloo, uh, we worked hard to create text for a sustainability policy at the university, which has since been adopted now by our board and by our Senate. So it's institutionalized as a policy. And then we created an environmental sustainability strategy to implement that policy. And this is where we started to embed the SDGs. So within our environmental sustainability strategy, we have content on education, content on research, on um, the operations, the various operations, and on engagement. I'll just give you an example here from the section on education, where we've specifically called out uh, the SDG target 4.6. By 2030, ensure all learners um, acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. So within our strategy, we have a number of goals and objectives. And here's just one example of an objective. By 2019, ensure undergraduate students from any program of study have the opportunity to learn about sustainability in their courses. So I'm going to come back to that one. But now we do an annual sustainability report, which is where we document our progress on implementing that strategy. And for example, here you can see the section on teaching and learning, um, which we've tied to four of the SDGs. And you can see from the, the progress snapshot that uh, um, 527 of our courses, both graduate and undergraduate, have sustainability within them. We're also in our sustainability report documenting our research in this space. So we've looked at the research of all the professors and, and tied them to say, well, which SDGs do these align with? Now, linked to uh, implementing the strategy on some of the topic areas, we've created action plans. So here's an example on the energy and climate change goals, where we created a very specific action plan on how the university will shift to be carbon neutral, in other words, net zero. Um, and so the shift neutral plan documents the pathways that we'll get there and the actions that we'll take to get there. We have a multi-stakeholder committee called the President's Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability. 
Now, this committee is made up of um, faculty members, students, staff, and senior administrators, and they oversee this entire progress, the process, both the development of the strategy and the implementation of the strategy. Under this committee are various working groups, and they're ad hoc. So, for example, when we were creating the strategy, we had a very specific academic working group that created the objectives, one of which I read to you. Um, and then very consciously, we disbanded that working group when it came to implementation and consciously chose to uh, embed the implementation through the existing systems in the university. But meanwhile, for example, in the energy one, the climate uh, plan that I showed you, we kept a working group there because uh, there was a need for a multi-stakeholder process separate from the existing uh, systems at the university to create that plan and implement that plan. So how are we ensuring that all students have access to sustainability? Well, we've launched a new sustainability diploma that's available to any student at the university, any undergraduate student. It has one core course, an online course, um, that since we've launched it in spring 2019 has had 400 students register. And then if they want the diploma, they have to do another three electives, one in environmental science, one in social well-being, and one in economic prosperity. And there's a whole list of options uh, from across campus that make this up. Oops. Now, besides uh, the formal curriculum systems, uh, there are a lot of other ways that we're embedding the SDGs into campus um, through the re research institutes. For example, I've just chosen here to highlight our Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology that uses the SDGs to report on their progress. And here you see a poster from uh, an event they're having just this month on nanotechnology for a sustainable future. Student groups as well are embedding it. Um, the one I want to highlight here is the SDG Impact Alliance, which is a student group that's actually uh, working to, to network all of the other student clubs on campus and help them realize how they, what they do aligns or could align with the SDGs. We've built it into staff training, so now um, staff have the opportunity to do professional development through a sustainability certificate, and we've built it into our co-op work placements. So University of Waterloo has uh, about 20,000 undergrads in co-op programs, and now what we're doing is uh, we're assessing those work placements in relation to how they further the sustainable development goals. So there are many more examples I could give you, but uh, really the point I want to make is the importance of institutionalizing this process. So if your campus doesn't already have a policy, if your campus doesn't already have a plan or strategy, um, if you're not already reporting, and if, if you don't have a multi-stakeholder committee, these would be places I would suggest you start in order to uh, create that vision for a sustainable future and ensure it gets implemented uh, campus-wide and institutionalized campus-wide. Great, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. I'm going to ask all of the speakers to turn their cameras on. Um, I think I could not have agreed more with uh, Sara. This would have been a wonderful uh, event altogether. We could have done breakout rooms to discuss some of the details of this second operation system, etc. Um, but we have to do with these. And um, indeed, the purpose of the guide was to create a community of university leaders interested in these topics that will be learning by doing and sharing these experiences. So hopefully this is just the beginning and we will be able to meet together. Um, let me ask you the first question. So how can faculty interested in teaching about sustainability and the SDGs and incorporating the SDGs throughout the curriculum do it when there is institutional indifference? So I think this could be for, for all of you, but perhaps Otto, I could start with you because you, you were referring to this question. Well, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the most uh, competent on that question. I, I think I, um, I would just say um, you always need to go with where the energy is. Or, or usually the energy is with the students and with very few faculties. So, so that's uh, one starting point. And the other one is you want to understand, you want to apply systems thinking, you want to understand where are the cracks. So where is the old system, right? 
and the old ways of operating, creating results that are not acceptable, even in terms of the system, right? The old logic, right? So where is it that, you know, you would get really key support from leadership as well? Because what we are, because this is a new challenge and the way we operate right now is producing results that are not acceptable for us. So understand the cracks of the old system, understand where the energy is, and align with the forces who already kind of um, want to operate in a new way. I think those would be the, 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 the directions. And, and also leverage each other. I think that's why the whole network is so great because I'm an innovator in my own place. No one takes me seriously, right? But if I can reference um, uh, uh, key initiatives from other universities or from other credible institutions, right, then it, it creates some currency. And that's how we need to work as a, as a network, that, w that we reference each other, support each other. And that's um, obviously another uh, mechanism that can be used for there. But I, I defer to others. I think uh, you're probably much more qualified to answer that. I definitely agree that peer competition, a healthy peer competition is very helpful. It's very helpful to be able to say, oh, but this university and this university and this other university are doing it. I found at Carnegie Mellon, a change in leadership was also a moment to be able to generate new ideas. So we had a new president in 2018 and then a new provost. And that the SDGs were helping to answer problems. They were, they were addressing, they were built for this moment. Uh, and that was that was helpful. You're never going to bring everybody along, but you don't necessarily need to bring everybody along. You need to find the champions and then build out from there. Yeah, I'd add to that just to say that you know individual faculty have incredible agency, and I think they um, often underestimate their their creativity around being learning designers. You know, they're designing this learning journey. And, you know, that can happen. You don't need um, a policy or, or some institutional kind of permission slip to, to be doing a lot of that. You can pick up your own agency. And, and I think, you know, engaging, as, as Otto said, with the students who are asking for this, but also connecting with the professional bodies, with the employers, and thinking about that broader um, ecosystem in which you're operating. So you, you can simply sit and have coffee with your curriculum team. You can find like-minded people. You can connect through to networks such as this. But I think realizing your own agency as an individual uh, change maker, if you like, within your classroom space, you know, you can really, really be a profound uh, learning designer uh, and embrace this agenda. I feel maybe I can contribute in a very operational example uh, out of Université Laval in Quebec, who is definitely a leader on the SDGs uh, here in the province. And uh, this example uh, relates to the Faculty of Medicine, actually. Uh, my colleague, Daniel Forget, who is a, an expert on the key competencies for the SDGs, had, con had contacts at the faculty, and he um, worked with two uh, medical students in order to actually implement the key competencies and the SDGs within a number of courses at the Faculty of Medicine. And together they've developed the concept of, you know, sustainable health related to One Health um, at the international level. And this has been incredibly successful. Uh, it was a bot, of course, it was a bottom up uh, kind of like extracurricular activity for everyone but it has become a flagship for the university and it has become an example of the integration of the SDGs and the key competencies within um, an education program that is reputed to be, you know, absolutely rigorous and, and strict, but they have been able to add uh, this DNA to the Faculty of Medicine, which is, I think, a great achievement. I don't have much to add, but I would say start with your own courses which you have control over. And, and uh, I would also say, look to your disciplinary profession. Um, I'm in a business school, and so the PM, PRME is a great support system for us. And uh, I know that's true for many other uh, disciplines as well, where there's some really excellent thinking, and that'll help um, legitimize it for your school if it's already happening at the disciplinary level. Great, there is one question about how can we ensure that local and indigenous wisdom and ownership are 
corporate rule mm -hmm. and whether the SDGs are in, in danger of corporate capture. Do any of you feel inspired by this question? So Maria, I missed the beginning of it, but are we worried about the, the corporations using the SDGs? I think so. Um, I, did, I did mention I'm in a business school, right? So um, I see that business can be a force for good. It doesn't mean they're only a force for good, not at all. But uh, having the businesses align some of their products and services with helping deliver on the SDGs, having them align some of their partnerships with helping deliver on the SDGs is the only way we're going to get to the implementation. I absolutely think the private sector has to be part of the solution. And uh, so will they make money off it? Well, their businesses and for profit is their mission. It's a part of that. But could they also have a social mission? Absolutely. So I'm not saying that all businesses are good, not at all. But the private sector, in my opinion, has to be a fundamental part of implementing the SDGs. I'll just build on Amelia's point with a very specific example. Uh, 5.2, 8.7, and 16.2 are all about combating human trafficking. Um, for 20 years, we've had a paradigm that is focused on really prosecution. To, to take this into a much more mainstream effort, we need consumers, we need young consumers demanding slave-free goods. So the private sector has potentially a huge role to play in delivering on 5.2, 8.7, and 16.2. Um, a slightly different take on the, on the question in terms of like the corporate culture of a university, if there can be such a thing. But, but I think there is a danger um, if, um, if universities are kind of looking at this agenda, if they're not being invitational, if they're telling um, their, their um, staff and students. I think particularly faculty, nobody likes to be told to do things. And so I think, um, as I emphasized in my opening comments, you know, that intellectual curiosity, that sense of finding your, your own way towards this, I think is really important. So I understand the accountability and the audit culture and, and the measuring and weighing all of this, but I do think that we must be um, cautious not to kind of uh, um, drive out the passion, really, and drive out that intellectual curiosity, which is really fueling this agenda within the university. So that's just a, a little take on the corporate. Yeah, I think that's a <clears throat> that's a very good point. And it's also true for, I mean, that's a, something I also thought in um, reading the report, right? So education for SDGs, okay. I mean, the SDGs are not the end of wisdom. I mean, that's just gonna work in progress. There's a lot of important things missing in the SDGs. So I think educate it's it's selling education short, right? ESDGs because education is a lot more, and that's why I started with Plutarch, right? So learning is about igniting the flame. It's about learning to think, learning how to communicate, how to relate to the world, to yourself. It's about a much deeper process, right? Activating the the essence of our own humanity. It's not just being useful for this or that agenda. Today we call it SDGs, tomorrow we call it something else. So, so I think there is um, a, a little bit, so that really resonates um, with also with me, even though I think the SDGs are a good first step. It's something, it's a framework we have, let's use it. But there's a lot missing, right? And basically everything transformational is missing there, right? So to the question that came up, yes, there's a big danger, right? And talk to John Elkington, right, the inventor of the uh, triple bottom line. He issued a recall because everyone is talking about um, uh, sustainability and all the reports of the world and so on. What's changing? Close to nothing, right? Not the essence. So, so that's why he issued the recall of that concept, which is underlying everything SDG, if you want, right? So, so the whole sustainability agenda. I think it's a very important question. And it's true that if we, uh, business needs to become uh, a force for good, but it's more than just, you know, issuing all these reports and doing all the right thing and saying all the right words. And of course, SDGs are at risk of, um, you know, being just used for that, right? More of the same. 
So the question is really good, and we should, uh, uh, and, and it should be addressed in in the mode of dialogue together with the innovators in business, because in business it's just the same like in our place, which is. Uh, it's work in progress in all these institutions, and we need to um, align with the right kind of collaborators and partners. I can maybe uh, just address a little bit, building on on uh, on what was just said. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was uh, you you all had like great interventions about business, but um, I think we're we're missing the part on the uh, indigenous uh, perspective. And um, I just want to preface by saying that I'm I'm not an expert in in any kind of way um, on this topic. Um, I very humbly am trying to get informed on how the indigenous perspective can be uh, put into context with sustainability and also with the SDGs. And I think for you know to, to speak to what you just said, Mr. Mr. Sharma, um, one of the pieces that's missing is exactly this this holistic view of the world. Because um, I had a number of meetings last year with some indigenous leaders in Canada, mostly located in uh, the social innovation uh, ecosystem. And what they were saying was that this is not the way that indigenous perspective thinks of things, thinks of nature. It's more of a one world view and not to have components and, and different parts. And this is something that is um, a completely different paradigm, which is something that we might consider to move to towards, to move from sustainability to thriveability and, and flourishing and to be one and to have, you know, this, this continue with the open heart, open mind, open wisdom, to have this holistic view, not only of ourselves, but also of the world. And this is, I think, um, a way to move from the dualistic view of seeing the world to a holistic way of seeing the world. And um, again, I, I'm not an expert in any way, and uh, I hope that it's a, a dialogue that we can have with Indigenous leaders in that sense, and that maybe the Agenda 2030 can eventually be reformed into something that is much more holistic. Decolonize, right, our language around these things um, can only be found out together. That's such, a, such an important point. So we have several more questions that are just super interesting, uh, but we do need to give the floor to Julio. So can I ask you all to give um, a sort of 30 seconds um, thought, final thought um, so that we can close with just one um, parting thought from each of you? I'll kick off if I'm being shy. Um, yeah, mine is really just to embrace uh, two things. One is this sense of the kind of connected, edgeless university that, that's embracing radical collaboration. I think that's really where, um, you know, the convening power of the university, this connectedness of the university. And I think the second thing is um, being invitational. I think Otto called on us to be humble in our listening. And I think there is such uh, an important part here around the humility that we adopt both with our students, but with also within an institutional culture. Um, and that goes to how do we operate then within this? And we talked about that second operating system. And that takes humility to understand that, uh, that there are different ways of doing things to, to, to be those radical change agents. So. Cohort 2030. The generation that will emerge over the next decade, whatever we're able to do between now and then, they will take this forward. There will be, I think, probably something that follows the SDGs. So investing now in this generation, increasing that literacy is critical. Thank you. I would say use your personal agency. So think about your sphere of influence. Start with the self. Is it your family? Do you have influence on your, your school? How about the whole university? What about your local community? Maybe it's the higher education sector. So where, where might you uh, have influence and, and use that and leverage that influence uh, to, to further the SDGs? 
I might add to that, that uh, this pandemic is giving us a tremendous opportunity to look inside and to look at our society and to see where the, the leverage is, where the opportunities are for transformation. Um, and I would add, you know, and this is from personal experience through, through this pandemic, I think it's been, uh, I think transformational is certainly a word that we can, that we can use for all of us. And uh, I know that for myself, it has enabled me to look much deeper inside and to really focus on what I can do to be the change that I want to see in the world. And I think that these words hold true um, in the work that we're all doing. And I would add also that community and not just the communities where we live, but also the community of practice, the community of mindsets and the community of values that we can join, that we can animate, that we can activate are incredibly important to support this this personal and um, planetary community transformation that we really need. That's, that's very well said. And I think to do all these things that you all just um, summarized, one um, maybe closing um, uh, aspect that could be added is um, that at the end of the day, we not only need new operating systems and new supporting structures and new uh, um, learning environments, we need a new idea of the university. Uh, something that's um, uh, moving from what in the classical university was uh, thought of as the unity of research and teaching, and then in the more modern or contemporary university has morphed into a really unity of research teaching and an application or a mass scaling of really practical skills to something that in the context of this century i i think really needs to be updated in terms of integrating research learning and the transformation of society and self that's the core and that's why what we now call the secondary operating system at the end of the day needs to be the primary and uh, so that's just but it will not happen from inside out it will happen by moving into these pockets of innovation and then wrapping learning environments around them and bring them back on campus and because these uh, projects that are already going on they need a support structure and that's why societies have something called education and higher ed so that's why we maybe kind of that's something a real opportunity we have and uh updating to do what you all just to summarize uh, at the level of scale necessary today also requires us to update the very idea of the university in this century. All of you for joining us today. It has been really fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask Julio to briefly present the guide and while he's getting ready, um, and we say goodbye to our phenomenal speakers. I'm just going to let you all know that um, the table, so the place that you were at before will stay open. So you can uh, get to meet each other there for the next half hour. And we are also going to post uh, an email address in case you want to send any suggestions or any experiences from your university or be in the loop for future um, events. Julio, over. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you everyone. Uh, I mean, after this incredibly inspiring and amazing talk, it's, I, I cannot say anything. So <laughs> just only five minutes to present the guide, which is, well, we were talking about this. And I just want to say that this is just the starting point. So normally people think about a report as the end point of something where you present the conclusion, some results, but that's... Um, um, work in progress. So we just try to, to, to s inspire here with some cases to empower universities and to bring some knowledge here to, to you, to all every high education system that want to, to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. But this is only the first, uh, the, the starting point. So what I would want to say is please 
try to let's work on on creating a community of people interested in implementing the SDGs and let's try to organize more of these discussions. Let's try to work at the local and regional level to find ways to collaborate. And Wendy talked about this radical collaboration. So let's collaborate between ourselves and let's bring other stakeholders and collaborate at different levels. So I would suggest you, if you can, to read this uh, guide and uh, come back to us with uh, ideas to promote and to create this community of, of people, of practitioners, of universities that want to really transform their, their systems to, to, work, to the implementation of the SDGs. So I just want to say that, as Otto said at the beginning, the guide is organized in four chapters. The first is about the why, and we all agree about the importance of this. The second is about the what. We also agree and we know lots of different initiatives that are interesting. And the third chapter and the fourth chapter is about the how. And that's a problem because probably we don't still know how to do that. And that's why we organized today this uh, session on, on how can we transform the universities. And well, the first chapter, the why, I won't go into the details. Second chapter, as I said, the, no, the what and third, the how. And when we talk about the how, there is a um, classical theory of change that could be uh, implemented in university, but the problem is that with the problems we are currently facing and the need for transformation is not possible to follow a classical theory of change. And that's why we propose a different approach, which is this second operating system where you can um, you know, show and practice a new way of doing things. And as Otto was also saying at the end, uh, then move from the second operating system to transform the first operating system and really change the university. And as this is hard to even understand and to replicate or to work on this, we um, uh, showed is, uh, this with uh, through four cases one in Spain, one in Australia, one in Malaysia, and one in South Africa. And just as also work in progress and, and first steps on developing this second operating system. And I want to end with, the, with uh, Otto's uh, uh, six points, because I think the operating system is about creating a space where you can work on these six uh, concepts. So bring people together to work in a different uh, way. Create a place where you can work in this way. Organize practice fields. Uh, partner with others. Uh, so like uh, fostering partnerships, creating pathways for transformation and implementing in reality this new pedagogy. I love these three points of open mind, open heart, and open will. So create a second operating system in your university to foster curiosity, compassion, and courage, and build from there and transform the university from this old second operating system. Because the only way to people to convince them is to practice this and to realize that that's possible and they can experience that it's possible to have this new university, this uh, reimagined university that we were talking about. So, oh, sorry, that's it. Just at, at the end, so that there are some case studies uh, in the guide as well. So we uh, did an open call for cases. We received more than 100 examples which were amazing and we selected around 50 to reference in the guide and there is a web page where you can read all the cases in more detail you have the qr code there as well if you want to to just scan now and go to the page and let's start so go to the page read it and please come back to us with suggestions to to stay in touch and to create this community Thank you so much. Thank you, Julio. Um, all right, so thank you all for joining uh, to our speakers, but to all of our participants that have been so active on the chat uh, throughout the session. Um, 
once again, as Julio reiterated, the objective is to create this community of practice. Um, the guide is a kickstart. We we are very humbled about what can um, the the product itself and what we want is for it to evolve. And in fact, there is an online um, repository of case studies. I think one of my colleagues has posted it in the chat. Um, so you will be hearing back from us because we will be organizing more events and we want indeed to learn uh, from from more case studies from around the world and for the next half hour the the session the other room with all the tables is going to be open um, if you sit in a table you can turn on your camera and your microphone and just talk with the people in the same table share experiences and thoughts about today's session um, and we are once again thank thank you for for having all of you um, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much.